May the holy names of Jesus and Mary and Joseph be blessed now and forever in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, celebrate the day. Great doctor, confessor of the church, St. Peter Damien, magnificent champion then of the impeccable moral life to which all clergy in all epochs of all times must aspire to. When this monk and reformer, Peter Damien, cast his critical gaze upon the Catholic Church way back in the 11th century, he encountered a panorama of corruption that would have appeared daunting even to the most hardened observer of the modern ecclesiastical scene. The household of God was in a catastrophic state of moral disorder, admitting of no easy remedy. The crisis of the period and Damien's heroic response of as much of, his, of historical value to us today as we confront our own explosion of clerical vice and doctrinal infidelity. The Church of Damien's time then had been rocked by almost two centuries of political and social chaos. And the doctrinal ignorance, scandals, personal behavior of the clergy had reached intolerable levels. Bishops and priests were involved in every kind of immorality, publicly living with concubines or illicit wives, or secretly engaging in homosexual practices. Many had purchased their ordinations and the lucrative benefits, benefits that accompanied them and spent their time pursuing scandalous secular amusements. Got to the point then where an outraged laity began to rise up against the ecclesiastical authority, sometimes in riotous outbursts of violence that threatened the civil order. Lo and behold, the pinnacle of the crisis was reached in the year 1032 with the election of a pope, Pope Benedict the Ninth, a youth of no more than 22 years of age, and the latest and worst in a long succession of compromised popes who served wealthy and powerful secular patrons. Mercifully few details of Benedict's personal behavior have been preserved in the historical accounts. But the popes, this Pope Benedict IX, his vile and contemptible life, his murders and other terrible deeds, and his depraved and perverse acts, in the words of the future Pope Victor III, were widely known in his day. However, in the year 1049, a new generation of reformers was on the rise, beginning with the pontificate of Pope St. Leo IX, and running through the pontificate of the great Hildebrand, St. Gregory VII in 1073. This is a time then of our champion to come to the fore, Peter Damien, who was famous for his life of austerity and penance, would act as a principal theorist of the counter-revolutionaries against the church's corrupt establishment. Damien provided the vocal firepower for their reform projects, publishing a constant stream of open letters and pamphlets that took on the dimension of every conceivable theological and disciplinary, disciplinary controversy. When it was necessary, he showed up in person to confront these corrupt actors and to humble them, including even the Holy Roman Emperor himself. Much of Peter Damien's 11th century form struggle seems strikingly relevant to the modern situation in our church today, offering us an incisive and, use and useful critique 
of sexual immorality among the clergy. Most relevant to our own age is Damien's famous book he wrote. In Latin, it said, it's called Liber Gomorianus, or the Book of Gomorrah. A long letter addressed to Pope Leo IX sometime between 1049 and 1054. The book, which is written against the epidemic of sodomy, rain, raging, he says, like a cruel beast within the sheepfold of Christ, has deep resonance with us today and offers many insights into the contemporary crisis in the priesthood. Damien's opening words, in fact, almost seemed addressed to the church of today, as he warns the Pope that the cancer of Sodomitic impurity is threatening the integrity of the clergy itself and urges him to act with speed, adding that, in his words, unless the force of the apostolic see opposes it as quickly as possible, there is no doubt that when it finally wishes for the unbridled evil to be restrained, it might not be able to halt the fury of its advance. Thus is the power of this monster. Damien was also concerned with the tendency of those in sexual perversion to seek promotion and advancement in the church and to recruit others into their lifestyle. He said, why, I ask, O damnable sodomites, do you seek after the height of ecclesiastical dignity with such burning ambition. Why do you seek with such a longing to snare the people of God in the web of your perdition? Does it not suffice for you that you cast your very selves off the high precipice of evil, unless you also involve others in the danger of your fall? Damien's rebuke blamed lax ecclesiastical superiors for their silence, silence with regard to clerical sodomy, and regarded them as sharing in the guilt of those under their authority. He says undoubtedly those who turn a blind eye to the sins of their subjects that they are obligated to correct also grant to their subjects a license to sin through their ill-considered silence. Later, he added that he would rather be persecuted than to fail to speak out, saying, indeed, I prefer to be thrown innocent into the well with Joseph, who accused his brothers of the worst crimes to their father, than to be punished by the retribution of divine fury with the high priest Eli, who saw the evil of his children and remained but silent. On one penitential canon quoted by Damien also directly addresses the case of the cleric guilty of child sex abuse. That is, he who persecutes adolescents or children or who is caught in a kiss or an other occasion of indecency. Such a cleric, Damien says, was to be publicly beaten and lose his tonsure. And having been disgracefully shaved, his face is to be smeared with spittle and he's to be bound in iron chains, worn down with six months of imprisonment and three days every week to fast on barley bread until sundown. For Damien then, the issue of homosexuality within the clergy was deeply related to the dignity of the priesthood. This is why he was making these cries and appeals because of this scandal connected with the dignity of the priesthood, in particular the sacrifice of the Holy Mass, which he saw as defiled by the offending priest, who is unworthy of offering the sacrifice, asking if such a priest is barely permitted to enter the church to pray with others. How is it that he can approach the altar of the Lord to intercede for the brethren? Look today then how many effeminate clergy are indifferent 
to the moral demands of the Holy Gospel. Damien thus declared that the practitioner of the vice is tormented spiritually and even physically. However, far from dismissing those who appease such urges of immorality, Damien insists, as we do in the Catholic Church, that they are redeemable and implores them not to give up on hope. There is always the possibility of conversion, seeking the mercy of Jesus Christ. He expresses grief over the noble soul made in the image and likeness of the Lord and united with the most precious blood of Jesus Christ and adds, you who hear Christ, the reviver, why do you despair of your own resuscitation? Hear it from his own mouth. He that believeth in me, although he be dead, he shall live. Remember then, in conclusion, as Catholics, we love the sinner made in God's image and likeness, but cannot accept the evil, immoral actions. Such souls suffering same-sex attraction have a huge cross to carry in their affliction, but they can save many souls if they embrace the cross. There is always Mary, the mother, Mary, the mother of mercy, to help bear the weight of such a cross. We call to mind the words of Our Lady to St. Bridget of Sweden, saying, I am the Queen of Heaven, and I am the Mother of Mercy. I am the joy of the just and the door through which sinners are brought to the Lord. Also, the words beautiful of the Lady to Juan Diego in Guadalupe, to those entrapped in this vice. Am I not here? I who am your mother, are you not under the shadow, my shadow and protection? Am I not the source of your joy? Are you not in the folds of my mantle, in the crossing of my arms? Is there anything else that you need? Mary then is truly the mother of tender compassion and our mother of mercy. Seek the mother of mercy then, if you are trapped in this vice, and you can disarm the sweetness, with sweetness Jesus Christ, the King of justice, and live an upright moral life to prepare you for the eternal bliss of paradise, amen. May the holy names of Jesus and Mary and Joseph be blessed now and forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.